as we get started this morning, I, I have one simple question for you. How many of you are animal lovers? You thought it was gonna be spiritual, right? Yeah. <laughs> you were really nervous. Okay, uh, I think I might have to go because I might get kicked out of the room here. Um, I bought a dog once and uh, it didn't go too well. I, you know when you get married, you do premarital counseling and, and you talk about all these things like, you know, real important stuff like where would you want a vacation or like, you know, like what's your mom like and, and how are you gonna turn out when we get old kind of things, you know. One of those questions on there is do you want a pet? To which my wife and I both said no. So I thought I was good for life until one day I come home from work and I found my wife looking at puppies on the internet for sale. And sure enough, day by day, I would come home and I'd be like, honey, you can't do that. Like, no, 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 don't. Because I just knew, like, she's about to catch it. Like, she's just about to catch it. And um, I kept telling her, you, you can't do that, you can't do that. And so sure enough, I started getting emails while I'm at work and text messages of links to puppies that you can buy off the internet. And uh, one day I came home from work and men, I don't know if you've ever do, done this before, but I would not recommend it at all. Uh, my wife invited me to go with her to the nail salon to just be with her. And uh, I went to the nail salon with her and man, those fumes, I don't know what it was. It just, something got to me. But three hours later, after we left the nail salon, we were standing in the parking lot of Walmart buying a puppy off of Craigslist. <laughs> and I know that your dog may be going to heaven, but that dog was not going to heaven. <laughs> you may leave this church after this. I don't know, you may not like me. I had a lady after service say, hey, I rescue animals if you ever wanna do it again. I said, honey, I will not wanna do it again, I promise. <laughs> this dog was a little terror and it was the most manly dog you've ever seen in your life. It's, it was called a multi poo, right? <laughs> so to top it off, I had this little like one and a half pound, three pound multi poo and um, it was, it was not a good experience. I'm, I'm just gonna be honest with you. Uh, you know, I just got to a point and place and time where I started praying, Lord, help me. Uh, one morning, uh, it was a Saturday morning, it was about 4.30 a.m. and that dog woke the whole house up. And in that moment, you can say, you know, my prayers were really spiritual. Lord, get this dog out of the house. And I went to Home Depot that day because you can take your real manly dogs to Home Depot. So I just thought I would take mine. And I'm walking around Home Depot and the lady who's working there, she comes and she sees the puppy and she gets down on her knees and she says, this is the cutest thing ever. She goes, I've been looking for a puppy just like him. <laughs> I can't remember, but your pastor might have lied and said, it's the sweetest dog you've ever met. I called my wife first uh, and asked, is this okay? And she said, absolutely, praise God. And uh, <laughs> that afternoon, I dropped this puppy off at her house and she was an animal lover. I mean, she had five, six other puppies for them to play with. Like, they, that dog is living his best life right now. I felt really bad all the way out of the driveway and then I was done and here we are today. <laughs> and now my kids are gonna ask me, Dad, why can't we have a puppy? And it's because of that experience that I had. How many of you know in life, sometimes you start something really strong? We went to the store that night. We bought way too much money worth of dog accessories, first time dog owners. I said, you know, I'm not gonna be one of those people, you know, that like pays a bajillion dollars to save my dog's life. My dog got a little rash in the first week of his life and I'm rushing him to the ER, the dog ER, spending $400 on this dog. I am all in on this little dog. How many of you know, though, sometimes the way you start isn't always the way you finish? I experienced that with a puppy. How much more in life? This morning, as we continue talking about building our faith and getting stronger in our faith, I wanna challenge you with this idea that the Lord wants you to finish stronger than you started. That whether you've been at your faith journey for the last 25 years or you've been literally at it for the last seven days since you came to the Ark Church last week, no matter where you're at in your faith journey, I believe that the Lord wants to help you finish stronger than you started. But how many of y'all know some things come along in life? Challenges, setbacks, hurdles, mountains standing in front of you, problems that you're not really sure how you're going to get through. And if I'm being straight honest with you, which I will choose to always be that with you, I have to admit that there have been times in my journey with the Lord that I've thought, I thought I was supposed to be stronger than this. I thought that this wasn't supposed to hit me the same way. 
I thought when I got this bad news that I would be, I'm a pastor. Shouldn't I be like, you know, immediately praying and praising God and thanking him? But I'm going to be honest with you. There are times in our life when things come our way that test our strength. And at the heart of what we're trying to do in starting a church is we want to build strength into people's lives. We really believe God is about more than just building the homes and the buildings around our neighborhood and our community that is quickly growing. We believe he's about building lives. And in order to build lives, we have to start at a place where we build strength because life happens, things come. As I was thinking about it this week, I was thinking about the things in my life that have caused me to waver or lack in strength. Oftentimes, we experience discouragement. It's something that lives in our world. You, you've experienced discouragement, maybe something little, maybe something big. Oftentimes, discouragement sets in when we have some unmet expectations in our life. Maybe you hoped things would be one way and it turned out different. Maybe you expected your family to go down one path and they went down another Maybe you expected that after you came to church that everything would all work itself out and you would never face another problem again and you're waking up on Monday morning wondering what happened? I was so strong at church yesterday. Why is it hitting me so hard today? Discouragement is very real. Sometimes we get discomfort in life. Sometimes there's some anxious things that come our way. We're uneasy. There's just this discomfort about the way things are going in life. And if we're honest, there are times when we just all out get derailed. Maybe some things came your way you didn't think would come your way and they hit you harder than you thought that they would. I wanna encourage you this morning with a message of hope for anyone in the room who has the ears to hear. There is a God who can give you a strength that no matter what happens to you today or tomorrow, you can finish stronger than you started. It's not a preacher slogan, it's not an Instagram slogan, it's not just something to hear in passing, there's actual biblical evidence to this. There are people who, although life happened to them along the way, their faith had such a seed deposited inside of them that when they finished their race, they were found faithful. When they finished their race, they were found to be stronger than when they started. As I think about that, I'm encouraged that the problems that we face in our life can actually become opportunities for us. It's easy to look at the obstacle you're going through right now and see it as a mountain that's standing in front of you. But I believe that as we read in scripture, there are some responses that we can have to these challenges in life that instead of coming out weaker, instead of coming out torn to shreds, we can come out with a bit of strength in our heart. Listen to this verse in Mark chapter 11. Here's what it says. It says, Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. I love that Jesus himself gave us a word of encouragement for the moments in life where we felt like we were standing up next to a mountain that could not be moved. He's encouraging us that there is a strength that can move it beyond our own strength. That God, our Father in heaven, can turn the things that feel impossible and he can make them possible. I'm encouraged by a guy in the Bible, his name is David. Many people have probably heard of David before. David was the king. We know that Jesus came from the line of David. David was known as a man after God's own heart. But what I love about the Bible, and if you're new to faith, here's what I gotta challenge you with, is this Bible is not full of a bunch of people who have their life all figured out. It's not full of a bunch of people who don't have any problems whatsoever. In fact, it's quite the opposite. You see, because I believe if I came in this morning and I was reading through my Bible and it was only people who had picture-perfect lives and everything was all together, I would leave more discouraged than encouraged. And our God, our Father in heaven, when he put the word together in the Bible, he knew we were gonna need a dose of encouragement to help us get stronger in the days ahead. There's a guy named David, and David didn't get it all right. David made mistakes. David had problems of his own, and yet he's known as somebody who loved the Lord. But I wanna, I wanna share a verse with you out of Psalm 51. It's one of my favorite passages of scripture. Here's what he says. David is praying a prayer, and he says, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. I think that's a powerful line. Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Some things didn't go according to plan. David made some mistakes along the way. And now he's standing before the Lord asking the Lord to restore what has been 
lost. And the reason I love this is because it's a prayer. And anytime you're in front of a mountain, I'm telling you, your prayers are powerful. And David is standing in front of a mountain of his past wondering what he's going to do. And the words that he chooses to use are the words, restore my joy. In other words, in order to restore something, something had to have been lost along the way. In order to restore something, maybe something didn't go according to plan. And yet David is willing to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I lost it, please bring it back. Lord, I got discouraged. Lord, I got discomforted by the things in my life. Lord, I I straight up got derailed. I went down a path I wasn't planning on going down. And I'm just asking you one simple request, Father, would you restore what's been lost in me? I've prayed that prayer in my life. I started strong, but sometimes it's harder to finish strong. But David knew that in the moment when he found himself not where he wanted to be, he could ask the Lord a simple question. Lord, would you restore what has been lost in me? And I believe as we start this morning and as we dive into Nehemiah that we've been reading about for the last couple of weeks, I believe the Lord is doing it because he wants to restore something in you. I believe he wants to put a joy back to your faith. Or if not that, maybe for you, he wants to help you persevere in the joy of your faith so that in the day of trouble, you will have what you need, the tools that you need to fight the battle standing in front of you. The first thing I wanna share with you this morning is you have to keep praying. If you're gonna get stronger in your faith, you have to keep praying. If I'm gonna get stronger physically, I have to go to the gym. If I'm gonna get stronger spiritually, I have to pray. You're like, yeah, yeah, that's what every pastor says. Yeah, yeah, we're in America, everybody's a Christian, like everybody knows God, right? Like, no, no, how many people pray? I'm I'm saying pray in a way that gives you the strength you need to live life. I gotta be honest that as I read in scripture and I find people and their first response is prayer, I'm like, yeah, 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 but what what else? And one of the things that I love about what we're about to read with Nehemiah is there was no what else. With Nehemiah, his first response every time he went through something difficult was to pray. Every time he found himself at the bottom wondering what to do, his first response is to pray. So let me give you a little background on Nehemiah. Over the last couple weeks, we've been talking about how Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall around the temple in Jerusalem. It's the people of God, all right? So they're building a temple, we're building a people. In other words, as you move from the Old Testament to New Testament, you see how much God really is about people. And as Nehemiah is rebuilding this wall, there are challenges that come his way. And the first thing that he hears is he's in exile, he's away from his home, and he gets a report about all the bad news and all the bad stuff back in his homeland. And what I love about the passage of what it says is it says there was great shame in the land. Things were torn down. And Nehemiah hears word of this, and his first response in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4 is he sits down on the ground, he cries, and he weeps, and then he prays. How many of you know sometimes in life we get discouraged and our first response is to fall down? But what I love about Nehemiah is just because he went down, he didn't have to stay down. The thing that brought him back up was his prayer. And he prayed. But we see a pattern in Nehemiah over and over. He kept praying in the moments when it mattered the most. So then he, the next chapter in Nehemiah chapter 2, he's standing before the king. The king says, what's wrong with you? I don't know about you, but if you ever walked to your office one day and somebody said, what's wrong with you? right? Not, not a very nice question, but the, the king could see that over Nehemiah, there was a grief on his heart. Something was wrong with Nehemiah. Nehemiah was perplexed, and the king said, Nehemiah, what's wrong with you? And, and if you're Nehemiah in that moment, you're standing before the king. The king could do whatever he wants. He doesn't like your answer. You're done, and Nehemiah's first response in that conversation with the king is he prays to the Lord right there in that moment. He says, king, or he says Lord, give me the words to say to the king that I might prosper, He asked for the Lord's help. Nehemiah then tells the king what's happening and the king sends him and gives him provision to go back and rebuild, but he never would have gone had he have never stopped to pray. He never would have charged off and led the cause and built the vision that God had given him if he had never taken the moment to stop and pray. But just because he was doing great God-sized things didn't mean everything worked out great. Nehemiah goes back to rebuilding the wall and all these enemies and all this opposition comes against him. Anybody ever said, I'm gonna go to church today, and then all kinds of crazy stuff breaks loose in your house? Your alarm clock didn't go off, your toddler's screaming, whatever it may be. How, How many of you know that when you start advancing in strength in your faith, opposition comes your way? The enemy came out against 
Nehemiah. Nehemiah is facing this opposition. People don't want him to rebuild the wall. They want to keep things the way that they are. But Nehemiah says, I have to do this. This is what God has called me to do. So when he's facing opposition, he's face to face with some discomforting opposition from people around him. You know what he did? Nehemiah chapter four, verse nine, and we prayed. Are you catching the, like, the, the study guide here? It's really simple. Yeah, it was always the best when your teacher told you all the answers to the test. Nehemiah is laying it out really clearly over and over and over. He didn't just pray, he kept praying. Because when you keep praying, it builds the faith that you need to fight the things that you're going through tomorrow. On top of that, if that wasn't enough, people start lying about Nehemiah and all the things that he's doing. They start spreading rumors, conspiracy theories about Nehemiah, served as a distraction. Nehemiah chapter six, verse nine, he prayed, but now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. I love Nehemiah's template for us as we start a church, as we come back to church, as we try and build our faith in our family, as we look for a job, as we, as we go through challenges with our kids, as we, whatever may be going on in your life that's standing in front of you, his first response is to pray. You have to keep praying. I wanna read this story out of Nehemiah. Here's what it says. People are trying to distract Nehemiah and they're giving him terrible advice and I wanna show you what his prayers do for him. Nehemiah chapter six, verse eight. Then I sent him saying, no such things as you say have been done. They were making false accusations. For you are inventing them out of your own mind. They're made up. For all they wanted to do was frighten us, thinking their hands will stop from the work and it will not be done. All the enemy wants to do is to get you to stop doing what God has called you to do. But Nehemiah prays and he says, now, O God, strengthen my hands. Verse 10, now when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehethabel, <laughs> good, I made it who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They're gonna kill you by night, Nehemiah. But I said to them, should such a man as I run away? There's a strength about him. And what man such as I should go into the temple and live? Uh, you don't go into the temple in their day. If he would have gone into the temple, he would have fallen over dead. They're giving him what sounds like good advice, but it's not good advice. And he says, I will not go in and in verse 12, he says, and I understood and saw that God had not sent these people, but they had pronounced a prophecy against me because they were hired by some other dudes. In other words, you got, caught that, thank you. <laughs> some people had been hired to encourage Nehemiah to do the very thing that would have actually hurt him, that would have weakened his position. And what I love about Nehemiah is he's resolved in his heart. He, he's got this purpose in his heart that I'm going to do what God has asked me to do. We, uh, I, I worked at a church and one day a, a seven-year-old boy came pounding on the front door of the church. I mean, beating on the glass. He was on the school bus on his way home and, and some bullies on the bus were threatening to beat him up. So he got off the bus and he ran straight to the church instead of his house. And I'm driving him back on the golf cart from the church. I'm driving him to his house. I always wanted to drive the golf cart. It was a good excuse. So I, I was driving him back to his house and I asked him, I said, you go to church here? And he said, no. I said, oh, well, have you ever been to church here? And he said, no. And I said, then why did you come to the church? And he said, he goes, um, I just heard that's where you go when you need help. Out of the mouth of a seven-year-old who had never, ever been. In other words, he's telling him, go to the church. That's the place you need. Nehemiah has people coming in his life and say, just go to church, go into the temple building. It, it'll all be hide out in there. And Nehemiah goes, no, that's not what I'm going to do. See, that's not the same as that seven-year-old boy running to the church. For him, that was exactly opposite of what God had told him to do. Here, here's my point. Here's what I'm trying to say. Because Nehemiah had prayed, he could discern and know what was good advice and what was godly advice. And there's a difference. YouTube has good advice. Google has, quote unquote, lots of good advice. There's a lots of O's at the bottom of that screen, I'm just telling you. But there's a difference in good advice versus godly advice. And as Nehemiah had prayed, it's what allowed him to discern what he was supposed to do in the moments when he needed it the most. Have you ever been in a time in your life and you didn't know what to do? And, and there's a lot of good ideas out there, but you're just not sure which one to take. I'm telling you, when you keep praying in life, it builds your strength. And when it builds your strength and you get to the moment where you need a specific word from God, that's the answer that you're going to need. 
he kept praying. But not only did Nehemiah keep praying, he kept believing. How many times did Nehemiah have people say, get down off the wall, stop doing what you're doing. People were coming at him, opposing him. But Nehemiah's first response was always, the good hand of my God is upon me. In other words, it didn't matter what happened to him, he chose to believe that God was still good and that God was going to help him. There's a, a, a verse here out of Romans chapter four, verse eight. I love what it says. It says, in hope, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. And as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. In other words, Abraham had a promise from God to have a kid, to be a father of many nations, but he was 100 years old. But he did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, which is as good as dead, or when he considered the barrenness of his wife Sarah's womb. He says this right here. No unbelief made Abraham waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. In other words, when you keep believing in God's promises, it strengthens your faith. There's a direct correlation. It says that he did not waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith. And as he grew strong in his faith, he was able to do what God had called him to do simply for one reason, because he kept believing in what God had told him. So keep praying and keep believing. My daughter, when, uh, when she was just learning to walk, she started doing this trust fall thing. She would like just stand up and, and then she would just like throw her arms up and I'd, I'd catch her. She'd do it right off the couch. If mom wasn't home, she'd do it off the bed, you know. And one day I'm standing on the other end of the kitchen counter doing the dishes and as I'm doing the dishes, I look up and I see my daughter over on the couch and I get that eye look. And you know the eye look I'm talking, I knew it was coming. And she just throws her arms up and she just goes right off as if I'm standing right there. Kitchen counter between me, I am not getting to her. I'm no superhero. And I'm thinking in that moment, that girl trusts me something fierce. She trusts me more than I could actually even be there for her. She didn't waver in her trust. It's this full, resolute mindset of a toddler that says my dad will be there for me when I need him and nothing could change her mind about that. So much so that she just, here we go. She doesn't do it anymore, you know, she kind of. <laughs> but how many of you know, when you trust the Lord with that kind of conviction, when you believe in his promises with that kind of faith, that when you throw your arms up, he's not like me. He'll be there every time. You don't have to waver and wonder, man, in the middle of this pit, is he gonna show up? You don't have to waver and wonder, am I ever gonna get out of this? You don't have to waver and wonder like, oh man, is God gonna show up in my life? Because he's faithful and he's good and he's true. And how many times did we just sing it? He won't fail. You just have to keep believing. When you keep believing, it builds your faith for the days ahead. And the last thing I wanna encourage you with this morning is this, you have to keep going. You have to keep praying, you have to keep believing, but you have to keep going. Nehemiah didn't stop. They tried to drag him off the wall, but he refused to come down. Listen to this verse right here in Nehemiah chapter six. It says, and I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work of God stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me not one time, not two times, not three times. They sent to him four times. And every single time he answered them in the exact same way. In other words, he just kept going. Some of you need a word of encouragement this morning. The Lord is saying, all I need for you to do is keep going. Yeah, but I don't know the answers. Keep going. Yeah, but I don't know what it's gonna turn out to be. Keep going. Yeah, but I'm not really sure. I keep going. Nehemiah kept going in the work despite what everyone around him was doing. And he built the wall faster than anybody could have ever imagined. Why? Because God was with him and God was helping him. Listen to this verse right here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. When I was young and immature, I started betting my dad for things. Dad, I'm gonna bet you 10 bucks that I can do this. Dad, I'm gonna bet you 20 bucks. One day I got up the courage. Dad, I bet you 50 bucks that I could beat you in a race. He said, bet. So 
So I told him, all right, we're gonna run. We're gonna run to the end of the street right here. And if I win, I get 50 bucks. If you win, you get 50 bucks. By the way, can I borrow 50 bucks? And he said, no, 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 no. We're gonna do it my way. We're not gonna run to the end of the street. We're gonna run all the way around the block. I said, fine, let's go. So we took off running. Y'all already know the story. My mom beat me working out last week. <laughs> Who won that race? My dad. You see, because in my young, immature mind, I thought, man, I'm fast. I'll get out. I'll be done before he even gets started. Because I knew I, I could run fast, quick. But what I didn't have that my dad has always had is a perseverance to keep running and keep going. So while my young, immature self was <gasps> on the side of the road, he's still running the lap. There's something about perseverance in our life. And the Lord is looking at us saying the exact same thing. You don't have to waver. You don't have to shrink back. You didn't get the answer you were looking for. It doesn't mean you're done. You, things aren't working the way you'd hoped. It doesn't mean God is finished yet. Don't waver. Don't quit. Keep going. What he says in Hebrews that I love is he says, you persevere. And when you do, you receive the reward of everything that he's promised. Can I tell you this morning that when you keep praying, you keep believing, and you keep going, God can do some things in your life that you once thought were impossible. Some things that you thought would never happen for you or your family or your marriage or your kids, he can do it. I remember it was right before COVID and right before COVID, um, I started noticing as I was shaving, I, I had a lump on my neck. And uh, you know, I, I didn't do anything about it for a while. I just thought, ah, whatever. And eventually I went to the doctor. And when I went to the doctor right before COVID, he said, yeah, you have a tumor on your neck. We did some tests and some surgery, uh, some preliminary test stuff. And he says, we need to get out of it, uh, get it out of you. There's some parts of it that have kind of sprawled out and are looking potentially cancerous. And, and we want to remove it. The only problem is it's wrapped around your vocal cord. And I remember him sharing that with me. And he asked me, what do you do? And I said, well, I kind of talk for a living. So that might be a problem. And I remember in that moment thinking, what am I gonna do? Have you ever played the what if game? What if this happens? What if, what if? And I'll never forget, he said, okay, we're gonna schedule a surgery. Well, the next day the world shut down and uh, they shut down all surgeries in the hospital, elective surgeries and all that kind of stuff. And, and I'll never forget for four months, I had to wait on the surgery, wondering what's inside of me, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna have everything that I need? And I remember there were times, I'm gonna be honest with you as a pastor, I'm gonna be honest, there were times I prayed hard. There were times I was upset. There were times I had faith that God could help me. And there were times that I just wavered. But I'll tell you this, through it all, when I kept praying and kept believing and kept going in my faith, I began to experience a peace of God in my heart that I hadn't experienced before. I had never had to believe God on that level. If you've been through something health-wise, you know what that's like. You're just, all I have to depend on is the Lord in this moment when you keep praying, keep believing, and keep going. So finally, COVID wrapped up some of it, and they opened the hospitals, and, and they took us in, and we went and had surgery, and they removed it. I'm obviously talking today. They got it out. It wasn't fully cancerous. There were some pieces of it, but, but here's the deal. At, at the end of the day, what was God's word to me in my life? I've called you to preach. You're going to preach. I've called you to speak. You're going to speak. I've called you to raise your family, you're gonna raise your family. I've called you to love and serve your community, you're gonna do that. It doesn't matter what you're up on the wall building and the distractions that come against you and say, you won't, you can't, it's not gonna happen for you. It doesn't matter because God is faithful and all you have to do is pray, keep believing and keep going.